Hello. Hello. This is September 25th, 2007. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig. Our cameraman today is Dan McDermott, and we are privileged today to have Rose Doing Young with us. Welcome, Rose. May I ask you when you were born? June 27, 1921. And where were you born? Lynn, Massachusetts. And you currently live in what town? What town do you live in now? Now, Bill Ricker, did Massachusetts. You, did you grow up in Lynn? No, I grew up and graduated from Revere High School. And what year did you graduate? 1939. After graduation, what did you do? Went into nursing school. And I understand that you are now widowed. Hmm? You are now a widow. That's correct. But you do have children? I have two daughters. You went into what? nursing school, and was it a three-year program at that time? It was time? a three-year program at Whitten Hospital in Everett. And after graduating from nursing school, what did you do? Went and <laughs> enlisted in the Army. What year was that? Uh, 43. Why did you enlist? Because that's why we were nurses at that time. So a lot of your they classmates? Was, they were standing over us, waiting patiently. Meaning the Army? The, well, the public, publicity, you know, they sent military people to recruit. They were, we had our minds made up that that's what we were to do. You know, that was what was our job at that time. Because the U wait. U.S. was in the war, is that? Hmm? Was, is it because you had heard that the U.S. needed nurses oh, in the war? Oh, absolutely, right. Yeah. Did you join with friends? Well, as we, what I did, and I think what most of the girls did, we had to take our state boards before we could enlist. So a lot of us went home, like, to spend a month or two with our families and kind of break the news that and what we were planning on doing. How did your family react to your decision? Oh, it, rather interesting for me, uh, um, a lot of the girls wanted to keep that information away from their parents. My mother was a little tender and weepy about it, but I had a dad who had polio, and when he was a boy, he used to practice walking so he could go and volunteer for World War I. And my grandmother would have to go and snatch him out and tell, and then he'd sneak off every once in a while until he became of age. So when he had, my brother went into the service a little bit before me, and he was very proud that he had his son volunteered. But of course, how many people that he knew had a daughter who went into the military. It wasn't, sort of wasn't done those days. Was he proud of you doing oh, that? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And you said you went into the Army. Yes. Why did you choose the Army? Well, I was in, in Everett, and Chelsea Naval Station is in the, you could see it from the hospital. And all of the girls, as they graduated and got their state boards, all volunteered for the Navy. And as I waited for my turn to, you know, get my credits and so forth, I thought to myself how 
terribly boring that is to spend your life in Chelsea. So I decided to pick the army because the girl, you know, I kind of investigated it and found out that she could, you didn't have to sit in Chelsea in the army. So that really was, most of the girls in my class were in the Navy. So when but you, I went into, you went into the army, so when you went in, did you have to go to a basic training? A basic training? Well, I was sent for basic training, but um, I did go, I in, changed my enlistment from Massachusetts to New York because my parents were there at that time. And I got permission to enlist in New York. And it was a very short time, a quick physical, and I went to, Sta to Staten Island to enlist the hospital on Staten Island. And we were only there, oh, I don't think we were there, but like two weeks. And then from there, where did you go? From there, I went to Camp Rucker, Alabama. And what did you do in Alabama? What was well, your daily schedule? We had what they called, we were already assigned to a unit that, to be sent overseas. When you went to Alabama, you were already assigned? Yes. Mm -hmm. And what was your unit? Do you remember what your unit was? What assignment your unit was? It was the, uh, the 312 Station Hospital. And did you know at that time where overseas you would be going? No. Okay, so how long did you stay in Alabama? Just a couple of weeks. And then you went overseas right away? They gave us a quickie course in basic training. <laughs> and how did you get, did you go to Europe? I went to, to England. And how did you get there? Well, and, um, let me see if I can remember. It was the British luxury. Like the Q, QE2, one of those, or? Oh, oh, not, not quite as big. It was a smaller uh, tour ship. And um, I'm trying to think of the name of it, but um, that's, I can tell you. That's all right. Up. Do you re was that your first experience on a large ship? Yes. How was that? Was it? Well, we had a race riot on our way over. We it went on the 15-day zigzag across the ocean. And before we were brought up here to Miles Standish for two weeks and then put on a boat here in Boston. And they had all the troops on indoors because this was December. And it was chilly. That we, you know, it was cold going across the ocean. So, but the last minute they dropped the gangplank on our ship and put black troops aboard that ship. And they assigned the black soldiers to sleeping on the deck. And, and they were kind of rioted. But the sergeant in charge of our hospital crew took all of the enlisted men and put them into groups and rotated them so that they could sleep indoors at night. So it wasn't just the black troops. But we had to have armed guards because they threatened the nurses. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll Go did, so that, did you un was, understand at that time that the unfairness of what was absolutely happening? Absolutely, mm -hmm. because I'll tell you that 
one of the things that was precious about my father was that my father lived in a family that never went to church. And when my mother found that out, she was horrified in those days. You know? So uh, my father was baptized at the same time I was their first child. And he became a very, very um, devout man, a man who researched as history and religion. And he studied us, uh, our Sunday school work so that he could learn. And one of the things that he talked about was the, when we were kids, and he used the Bible to show us that there were people of different colors and that they were still God's children and all this sort of thing. And he even brought my youngest sister a black doll mm -hmm. because we lived and that's it. There were no, we had never seen a black child. So he had to buy that doll to teach, you know, to teach us our Sunday school lessons. So he was a man. So we were very concerned. Right. The nurses were. And your dad was very much a man ahead of his time, wasn't he? Right. Thinking that way. Absolutely. Because that would have been in your younger days. But I got. Part of my story is in the Battle of the Bulge, we were surrounded and black soldiers saved all. They came in and took us out in the middle of the night. And they saved and you. And they were segregated at that time, but they were friendly with us and talked to us and they were concerned that we were in that building. Well, let's get back to that in a little bit. Let's talk a little mm -hmm. bit more. You had mentioned, let's talk about going over and arriving in England. Right. You had mentioned zigzagging, and I, I know what that means, but for the people watching this tape, explain why the boats zigzagged. The boat zigzags because it's then not as good, great an tar easy target for the uh, enemy ships to, uh, to fire on. And did you have? We did have some fall. German ships. They, they followed did you. Tell us we had to go to safety areas and so forth because the Germans were following us. But an Amer you go in convoy, which is a, a group of American ships with. They tuck a hospital ship in, so that you're surrounded by. Uh, you know, uh, these other, for safety. Did you ever have a sense of fear on your way over to England? I think we, we were very young, first of all. And there was more a, a sense of excitement you know, you come out of nursing school where they treated, treated you like you were living for three years in a convent <laughs> and, then, and then go into the military is quite a change. And I think that we were excited about it more than afraid. Sure. Yeah. It was a bit of an adventure. Oh, absolutely. You arrive in England. Mm -hmm. And then what? Well, we landed in Liverpool in the middle of the night. And it was pitch black. And they put us on trains and took us to a town, Stafford. England was in the Midlands of England, and we had, they had, a hospital set up there, and I, we were all switched at that time to what was then numbered, 
the 130th General Hospital, and we were there to treat and research combat fatigue. And we had to study it ourselves, but also doctors and medical personnel from allied forces of all kinds came to us and we had to show them how we treated the patients that were disturbed. We were getting patients then from Italy, from the, the uh, fighting that was going on in Italy. A lot of those boys were brought to England and we, we then would get them and give them, you know, treatment so that they were able to, many of them, go back to duty rather than to be sent home. Were there any occasions when you felt that some of these soldiers should not go back to duty? Absolutely. But it was not our decision. You know, we didn't really... Nurses then didn't have the same power that they do now. Sure. You know, now a nurse can speak up and say something to a doctor, but of course we did. We had to stand at attention, and that was before we got in the army with doctors at that time. Sure. So it it was, you know, certainly sometimes we sit around a cup of tea before going to bed at night and discuss it because we were amongst ourselves because we were not understanding it sometimes. And Do you have any one particular soldier or incident that stands out in your mind about that situation? About that? No, because they didn't stay. I do have a, my favorite soldier, but it was later during the battle, the bulge situation. But uh, they were with us and sedated and so forth. There wasn't the same chances of becoming familiar with your patients because of the heavy medication and so forth. A wounded soldier is much easier to deal with than a mentally ill soldier. How long did you stay in Stafford? Oh, uh, uh, 10 months. 10 months. And then where did you go from there? To Normandy. You went to Normandy. What, what time of year and what year was I that? I went to Normandy, let's see. I'm trying to think. Would it have been 1944? We went, we went down to the southern part of England at the time of the invasion to wait our turn. And we, I think, I'm, I'm, I'm a little off on the months, but I think that it was about maybe two months, two, I think into the first part of July that we went, uh, that we went over because we were then a general hospital. We were, the whole hospital personnel were on a ship in a River, they're waiting to land, and the ship that we were on at that time was the private yacht of the King of Belgium. Really? Not the, this one, the one I have pictures of, that's his son, he was only a little boy then. So it was the private lot, yacht of the then King, King of Belgium. King of Belgium. And while waiting, had you, did you hear anything about the invasion oh, or about the casualties? We could hear the, you know, 
because even when you went to London, they allowed us to go to London for a week's leave. And we had to sleep down in the subways because uh, the Germans, you know, bombed every night, London every night. Being in, in the thick of that, what was it like for you as a young nurse coming out of a subway in the morning and seeing the devastation? Well, we tried. <laughs> we were pu almost punished for being naughty because w when they were set off the alarm at the hotel, the Red Cross was in charge of that hotel, and that's the only hotel that women military could go to. So what we did, the alarm went off. And the first night we were there, we just crawled back into bed. <laughs> so you didn't take it seriously? We didn't. We just ignored it. The second night we did the same thing, and one of the matrons came through and caught us. And we got a very proper British tongue lashing. So but not, after that, we did go down in the subway and sleep. So not only were you adventurous, but you were fearless at that time. Was that your nature as a young woman? It was. Yeah. yeah. So I was an extremely shy person as a kid. And it was a challenge for me to do the things because I was a sh kind of ashamed of being shy. So this was a new you. Yeah. So you went to Normandy. Did right. the yacht take you right on to the shore? We, no, we had to go down over the side on the netting and climb down into a landing barge to be taken in onto the beach. And where did and you go the, from there? Those pictures with the front dropping down and you're running in the water, that was... You did that too. Did. And where did you go once you hit the beach? Well, they took the women to a cow pasture back off the beach. We had an, a, a problem at that time because all of our personnel were on that yacht. But our equipment to set up a hospital got bombed when they were trying to get into the beach. The boat got sunk, so we had no equipment. So actually what they did with us was there were a lot of like uh, field hospitals working all over the farmlands there in Belgium, I mean in Normandy. And so they would take us in trucks every morning and we would go and work at those hospitals. And then at the end of the day, they'd take us back to our own. We were sleeping in the pup tents in the field. So we'd have to go back and how long did you stay in the field and in those pup tents? Oh, we were there for maybe about three weeks or so. And then did you move forward just like the... Um... By the time we moved forward, we had, had uh, Paris had been captured, and our commanding officer went to Paris to... to get an assignment because we were getting kind of bored sitting around in the cow pastures. Now was your commanding officer a woman nurse or was it a male army our, officer? Our immediate one was, but the commander of the hospital was a doctor. Was a doctor and a man. A man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> didn't have women doctors. Not then, anyway. <laughs> and they didn't have male nurses then. Right. So he went to Paris, and did he... And he got an assignment, and we were trucked from town to town up until we got to the town of Sine, Belgium. 
and we were in a building that was a Christian Brothers Monastery. The Germans had confiscated the building and made a hospital out of it when they took over Belgium. So we had to go in there and it was lucky for us because we had all the German equipment to work with. And you were able to work with it. So, uh, yeah, some of it was better than, uh, much of it was better than, uh, uh, like all the dental, the dentists were thrilled to death because they had some pretty raunchy material to work with. And uh, they loved the German equipment because, of course, prior to that, I believe a lot of that kind of equipment was made in Germany. So they had the equipment there too. Now when you got there, were there already wounded soldiers at that hospital or did we, word get out that that's where it was going to be? We, we set up. You set it up. For the psychiatric unit. So you, was your specialty then psychiatric nursing? Uh, yes. So tell us about that. You're in Belgium, and soldiers Usually, are coming in. there was one nurse. We had a patients, some patients inside the building, but most of the build, most of the patients were tented, and they, I think they were sixty bed tents. Sixty bed tents. And there was a nurse for each. Tent. And the tents were on the property and they of were the on like the back fields, mm -hmm. facing the back of the hospital. And there was a young man in our hospital that invented the campus connection that connects and makes continuous wards out of those. And they still use them. Yeah. So, as a nurse, you had 60 patients. Individual, as an individual nurse, you right. had 60 patients to care but for. But our biggest blessing was that we mostly supervised enlisted men that had been specially trained at Walter Reed. Would they have been called corpsmen? Corman. Corman. So you Beautifully helped, trained. So you supervised the corpsmen. Does any particular story come to mind yes. while there? Tell us about Nurses that. Nurses were not allowed to do intervenuses. You could not put a, <laughs> a needle in a vein or start an IV or anything. But our corpsmen had all been trained to do it, and so they did it. But you knew how to do it. Huh? You knew how to do it. You were just not allowed to do it? We never were taught how to you do weren't. it. We had to call the doctor to do it in, in, in any hospital at that time. And then, and then instead of the doctors you overseas... You had to set up a tray with whatever you wanted for him, but you had to call. If the hospital had interns and residents, you called one of those that was on your service, or the, the attending doctors. And in this case, the doctor might not be available, so the corpsmen could do it. The corpsmen were taught at Walter Reed how to do it, but they never thought to teach the, the nurses. nurses how to do it. So how long were you at the monastery slash hospital? One we year. One year. How long were you in Europe? I just got out of school. I got my... I, I reported for duty September 3rd. And I got my license October. And then you went over. And I went over with... And we were all green kids. How long, totally, how long were you over there? I was 10 months in England. Mm -hmm. 
and a year in Belgium. And then we went back to France for months because we then had been reshuffled. I had, because of what I did during the bulge, I was put on a surgical unit to do a, a tree find, which nobody knew what tree find was then. Explain what that is. Well, you know, when you come into, have you ever gone to an emergency room? Yes. And the, the, you, the clerk at the desk checks you in. Yes. And then a nurse is followed behind that. You are given your blood pressure, this and that. Is that like she triage? Talks to you. Triage? It is triage. Okay. Yeah. But that was a word that nobody, nobody knew, knew then. Okay. But I had been called in from my psychiatric tent out in the field and assigned to this room that was near the surgery. And I had a crew of young corpsmen that were lab technicians. So they did all the IV work. And we had it all set up as to how to I had one week's training when the Battle of the Bulge came breaking through and I had to go on duty. In, they had a big ward just in the hall because we had 1,500 patients a day. How far away were you from the Bulge? It was in our you backyard. Were, you were right there. Yeah. Were they were, we could look out the window and see them fighting. And if the, some of the doctors went up on the roof, if there was a little quiet, and you could see where the Germans had abandoned their tanks down at the foot of the hill because they ran out of gasoline and they couldn't get, a, they were unable, they planned it actually that they would take our guess, but the, they wouldn't let them. Were you ever fearful of some, of some of the other interviews that we do? We ask if the soldier was in direct combat. Were you that close to combat that you ever feared for your own life? Well, the, they came. The commanding officer came to me. I had 10 days. 24-hour duty in that room. None of us, they would bring us a sandwich and a cup of coffee every once in a while. And there was a one-stall toilet on the, over on the corner. And if I had to go to the bathroom, the boy, I would just signal to one of the boys and he'd stand guard outside the door while I went in and went to the bathroom. But uh, you just did, I can't, it's such a, a, a wonderful gift to me because I learned from having to do what nobody taught me to do. I just did it by instinct. You had to learn. I had to do it. And I learned to supervise because I had these men. They were trained men. They had, in some fields, more training than myself. But one of the blessings was when I came home, every time I went to work at a hospital, I would get assigned a general duty nurse on the floor. And it wasn't long before I was sitting at the desk in charge because the people that I worked for realized 
But I had no degrees past my three-year school, and yet I was in charge of everything. You had a skill. I learned from, you know, from just, I didn't have to go and sit in college because all, and I worked flower Fifth Avenue, Maimonides in Brooklyn. These are hospitals. Brooklyn Jewish Hospital, all of the big hospitals in Brooklyn I worked. And getting back to, so you were there during the Battle of the Bulge. Um, you were right there with the Americans fighting the Germans. That's right. You were taking care of, helping to take care of over 1,500 wounded, whether it be emotionally or physically wounded per day. You were overseeing corpsmen, and you were... Even gave birth. We even delivered a baby. Tell us about that. Well, the Germans in the town near Sinai, the Germans had chased a woman, her husband, and she, had, she was at term. She had a couple of children, and the Germans turned them out of their home so they could put some of their offices in it to take relief time, use their beds for sleeping. So they came into the hospital, and the building that we were in was this huge brick building with this big um, entry hall with the chapel behind it and uh, uh, Christian figures of, you know, a typical Catholic institution. And uh, she came in. That's where the soldiers came in that front door, and they had doctors and enlisted men there checking each one as they came in the front door and then sending them up the side stairwell to where I was. My stop was the next stop. But what happened was, this woman came in and she was in very active labor. So they called a Dr. Jesse Frankel, who was an obstetrician, to come and help, you know, whichever doctor had the, the woman patient. And uh, he called, uh, he went to her, and the woman didn't speak English. And she was ready to deliver. So he called out and he asked if there was any of the corpsmen that were helping that spoke French. And this young soldier, Jerry Bassner, spoke up and said, when I was a boy, I went to Catholic school and they had French nuns, so I think I can help you a little bit. And uh, so those two men delivered the baby. That's amazing. Right there on the floor. Wow. And a very interesting thing has happened because when I lived in Brooklyn for, for a while, my husband came from Brooklyn and my kids went to school there. But when I moved back to Massachusetts, I joined this Battle of the Bulge organization, and there was Jerry Bassna. You met he him again. He lives out in Whiting, Whitingville. Whitingsville. But, Whitingsville. And he was there, and of course, a big uh, we didn't know each other overseas because he worked in a different place. Now, Jerry had gone back to Belgium 
hoping that he could find that baby. Wouldn't that be wonderful? And he never could. He they never put could. ads in the papers over there and everything. He had a Belgian friend who helped him. Yeah. Got the newspapers on it and for several years. All we ever heard from Jerry at every meeting was my baby, I wish I could find my baby, and so on. That was his heart's desire. And he never did. So he went to Belgium twice, couldn't find her. The baby had been named Jessica. After? After Dr. Jesse Frankel. And the baby could not be named Jessica because it wasn't a saint's name. And Belgium is a very strict Catholic country, and so they went registered her as somebody else. But she was in the family and so forth every once in a while on her birthday, which was Christmas Eve. She was called Jessie. They tease her a little bit about it. So someone did find her? I was looking for some children that I had helped to have a Christmas party at that time. We used to take the children. They were badly, nutrition was awful in those countries. So that was the nurse's goody-goody. They would take these children and give them little parties and get fruit for them and food for them and so forth. So I had a picture of us having that Christmas party. With, and they do St. Nicholas Day, they don't do Christmas. Mm -hmm. So on St. Nicholas Day, which was just before all of this started, we had a party, and in my pictures, I had a picture of the children. And those pictures have disappeared, and I, I'm so upset about it, but I still have the story. This Belgian man, actually his grandfather migrated to this country, but he his father did work in Belgium for an American company he, because he spoke the language and so forth. He had a good job over there. So he, when the Germans invaded Belgium, Chris was a little boy of nine, and he was one of nine children. And he joined a battle of the Bulge thing and came and he would take some of the guys over to Belgium and show them around and he was very much putting the two countries, trying to help the two countries. This was after the war, this after battle the war. of the Bulge club that right. you had joined. Right. Okay. So I went to, he made arrangements for me to be taken by a relative of his back to the hospital where I was stationed. What was that like for you? And I didn't know these people in the village. I'm sure I, they were only children when they were there. I put the picture in the newspaper and several of those little girls came and said, that child with the bow in her hair is me, madame. I, ha I never cried so much in all my life. What a wonderful story. And this was December 04. 2004. Mm -hmm. And I found my children that I was looking for. And how old are they now? They're in their 60, 60 plus, mm -hmm. whatever they were then, because it was the 60th anniversary of the liberation of Belgium. Mm -hmm. So they took us back to this hall, and the mayor 
presented me with the certificate of citizenship. And I really represented all of the girls that had gone, because I certainly didn't do everything that they talked about. Those women would come up to me and say, look at my hands, how beautiful they are. And I saw a pair of 60-plus-year-old ladies' hands. Then they go on to tell me that when they were a child, she had picked up, out in the field, she picked up a grenade, and it blew, and she, her hands were injured, and her mother brought it to the Americans on the hill, and the doctors operated, and on. I got story after story, and CNN News had their camera on me through this whole thing. So you were now, called the Americans on the Hill. The Americans on the Hill. And all these people came in, they were children, and they remembered because there was no medicine for them. There were no local doctor to go to or anything. So they remember that we took care of their problems. So I was listening to all of this, and they'd come and they'd lay these huge bouquets of flowers. And Sine has a big brewery, and they have their own beer, and they have gift packs. So some of them, I had 12 big packs of beer and so forth. They brought me gifts like you. I was covered with flowers. All of a sudden, this woman walked up to me and she said, Madame, I am the baby Jessica. That must have been so emotional for you. It was, because they brought me pictures of their whole family. They were presenting it to me, but I saved it. And I saw, too, that, that as a matter of fact, they sent it special delivery. I sent it home to Jerry. So he was able to see. So he, he's, he's, his health is extremely poor. He could not make the trip ever again. But at least it was me who was a friend of his. You see, such a coincidence. It is such, such a coincidence. A, a, a thing to happen. He, when he walks into a meeting, of course, I get all the big hugs. And Jerry's a very special veteran. Sure. Because I don't know whether you've heard the story, but when the 101st jumped onto that area, Jerry was taken and put on one of those planes. He was a medic. He was trained at Walter Reed to be a medic. But he's so scrawny, even as an old man, he's one of these little tiny men. And they put him on as a medic on one of those planes. And he said, I have never jumped. How can I go, you know, with them? So the sergeant took him over to the back of a truck put him up on the truck and told him to jump off the tailgate. And he said, now you're now a you paratrooper. Know <laughs> <laughs> and Jerry, in one of those towns over there, there is a very famous story and picture that when the paratroopers came down, one of them got hung up on the clock yeah. Do you remember? Yes, I've uh, heard that hear story. That story, Jerry, because he was so small, was still a paratrooper at that time, and he went up in the tower to get that man down off the clock. Oh my! So he, he himself has a big story to tell. Sure. Tell me about the medals that um, are around your neck. 
If All you right. could show them to the camera, too. Uh, the Grand Duke of Luxembourg, which is the reigning monarch of Luxembourg, had a private session with just the veterans. Our families couldn't go. A lot of security problems over there. And his officers put this around my neck. This one came from Luxembourg, and it's a, a medal of commemorating the 60th anniversary of the liberation of Luxembourg by the Americans. So you see, in Europe, we do have people who love us. <laughs> yes, and what about the second one? Now this one, the King of England had one of his generals put these around her neck in a ceremony also. Now when you went into the service, what was your rank? You go in as a second lieutenant, all there is is a second lieutenant. And after Belgium, where did you go? Well, after Belgium, we had some time there. What, what we had to do was to clean up. We never left a mess. That was an American thing, that they never left a mess behind them. So we had to clean up the nurses' stations and get all of that material cataloged and either given to the Belgians or shipped out if they didn't want it, but it had to be done. Now, earlier in our conversation, very early in the conversation, you had mentioned the Black Brigade. Okay having saved your lives. Right. Talk about that. Okay. Um, the hospital was located on the Red Ball Highway. The trucks going over it all the time, those roads were muddy. The same thing with the roads into the grounds of the hospital. And we had a engineering group assigned to us to do the engineering on the roads. They would put temporary roads in, and of course it would you'd have rainy spells, and the roads would become mud holes. Those boys were out there working. And they had a, a, a prefab building across the road where we could go and play cards or have a, have a drink or something. That was the officers' club. It was pr pretty bare, but it was getting away because we were billeted in the main building. First of all, there was always the problem of security. We were not allowed to go out the front door if it was starting to get dark. We had to have a soldier accompany us to the officer's club. And sometimes those, uh, the, the uh, engineering boys would be out there working, and they kind of joke with us as we go by, you know, you may, that's kind of the way that nurses and GIs got along was that they had kind of a, you know, te they teased you, we teased them, that sort of thing. and. If the roads were damaged by the trucks, those boys would pick us up and carry us across the road. And it was fun. Sometimes they'd put 
two of them would put their hands together and make a seat and get. Other times they just whoop you up and across the road you were. We became very, not intimate, of course, with them, but you got to know these kids. And you were kids, too. All yeah. of you women, you were all kids, yeah. weren't you? But we were... We were old ladies, though, because you mature awfully fast. We've heard that from some of the men that we've interviewed with, too, that they grew up very fast. They, yeah. they went over as boys and came home as men. Yeah. And they, the boys treated us, everyone of them, our own patients, Soldiers are passing through. Oh, there's women here. Oh, the nurses are here. To this very day, you go to a veterans meeting and they're dragging you over to meet their family. Sure. Because they cannot express to you enough to, you know, just how fun they were of nurses. Now, were, and, I'm sorry, were the engineers, were, was that the black unit, or was that yes. a, it was? When so tell us, a, yeah, tell us the, about that. They, it was a black engineering unit that was assigned, they were down the road from us, but they were assigned to a hospital, and they had white offices. And one of the white offices, had become engaged to one of the nurses. And he, the boys knew that he was a wreck because she was one of the 12 that were inside that building. They had taken the other girls to France, but 12 of us stayed, were... Packing up and taking care of some of the... We had wounded that were too far gone to mm -hmm. move them. So there were only 12 of you left. You had the engineers working on the roads. And what happened? The boys knew that their, commander, their officer was very worried about the girls inside. So they came in and snuck up the back stairs and they were preparing to evac had orders from headquarters to evacuate the whole hospital but they didn't have the transportation so they came in and said we'll give you 10 minutes to go to your room and get your back your backpack don't stop for anything else go as you are come back here in 10 minutes and they put us on the back of trucks and took us to France. We drove all night and part of the morning. And those kids, when we had to go to the bathroom or anything like that, would form a line shoulder to shoulder so the trucks passing on the road wouldn't see us going to the bathroom. So they really took care of they you? They brought us out of there. Mm -hmm. And, then, and every time since then that I've ever gone to a veterans meeting and I see a black veteran, I have to go and ask them because I've never found one of them. But I did participate in the dedication of that uh, out at the cemetery you know, the uh, state cemetery, mm -hmm. because it was, it meant something to me to honor black, they were of the black, it was in the honor of the black soldiers that were massacred in the Battle of the Bulge. So this engineering unit took you to France, was it over then, or? No, oh, the next day we went back because they had pushed the Germans out of there and we had to go back. And we had to clean up the building because 
somebody had uh, torn, you know, did they, we don't know who did it. It could have been the other soldiers that found the liquor, or it could have been civilian kids, or it could have been the German. We don't know. They trashed. They our, trashed the the our building. Mm -hmm. So, but we set up another hospital and went to work and did psychiatry. But we knew first of all it had been rumored that we weren't going to be there long because they had planned, and all of our planning after that was keeping in mind that we were scheduled to make the invasion of Japan. So after all of your activities in Europe, you were scheduled to go to Japan. How close did you get to going to Japan? We were on a boat <laughs> out in the Atlantic, headed for whatever, no time off. But they dropped the atom bomb, so they I turned our ship around and took us into New York. When you heard about the bomb being dropped, how did you feel about that? Well, I don't, we did hear about it, but I don't think we knew enough about it to understand what it was and what it was doing. All we knew was that Truman had ended the war. Coming into New York, did you see the Statue of Liberty? Was, what was it like coming home? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, when a ship came into New York Harbor, we had, first of all, going from Belgium, we were on the tip of France, down south, the southern part of France, in a secret camp because we had been told where we were going and they couldn't find transportation that was suitable for women. So that's what they were waiting for and they eventually took us over to England and got a ship over there to, because the men had, had already gone on their way. But uh, there was only a few girls. We had a couple of girls with us that had been volunteers before the United States went into the war. They volunteered in the British service. So it was, uh, they were allowed to go home. So did you keep in contact with any of your nurse friends that you were with over Not in Not too much, a couple. And you came back to Everybody, New York. You know, you go to veterans organizations and there are very few medical people. Doctors don't join, you know, like the VFW, any of those you don't, because it's like you come home and you go to work, because you're always needed. It isn't, they're just not people, that, there's a few doctors here and there that will join when they're at retirement age. Now, when you came home to New York, you did you go right back to work? Did you have any time off? I, I had a doctor as a boyfriend. It was a very difficult situation. How much of this is going to be? <laughs> um, actually, we were extremely close to each other. But we had a problem of religion and the only way we could have had a relationship was to 
wait for his parents, who were too much older than mine, to go, because he trained in a Christian hospital in New Orleans and secretly wished to be a Christian, but his family were Orthodox Jews, mm -hmm. and he couldn't do, he didn't, wasn't able to tell his parents. He even went so far as to try to teach me to be Jewish. <laughs> but... Uh, so the relationship didn't last? Uh, but what we did do was to go take a G.I. I I went to uh, Northwestern and he did a residency there and I went to to, I did a job, I, I didn't go to school, but I did work for the hospital there. And uh, then I went home, settled down. Settled down, Take, met your husband in New York, your, yep. and settled down. And then you had mentioned earlier, worked at a number of hospitals in oh, the New York area. Yeah, because you know what? It, when you're young and you're having a family and so forth, you, it's not a steady job. You work a lot of part-time. When you came home, did you discuss any of your ventures and adventures with your family? You didn't. That's why I'm going crazy right now with the Holocaust. This creep that came into our country and says this never happened. This, I might add, is the latest news about the president of Iran coming in and speaking to uh, students at Columbia, and he will be speaking at the UN uh, with regards to some of his beliefs. I know, because during the time at the very end of the bulge, our hospital was sitting there, big, not being used because once the war ends, nobody gets sick. <laughs> you know, it, there's a, a little psychology there, but it's true. And we had boys that would be ser secret service. We had some of their officers from the Secret Service. We saw, we heard their stories. We knew they would talk personally to us. But it was not for public knowledge. And these were we stories about the prisons? About going and oh, you know, releasing the people from those camps in Germany and stuff like that. It, was, it did happen. I took care of a whole room full of American boys who came back from those camps. And if you could see what they look like, can you imagine what those record, those Jewish people that were starved for years then after that, I lived in Brooklyn, and I saw those people walking around with their tattooed arm. In the, they tried to cover them, they'd wait long sleep, but in the summertime, they'd come out with, you know, uh, and these people, I lived right in Flatbush section of Brooklyn, and oh, saw see. these people, I got to talk to them, I knew them, and to say that it didn't happen, it did happen. When you came home, did you join veterans organizations besides the Battle of the Bulge group? I didn't even do that till later. Mm -hmm. Did you receive any veterans benefits, such no. as hospitalization or any of the GI Bill? No. No nurses were allowed to receive that at that time? It, we. It had to be, first of all, I did go to the VA hospital for a while before my husband died. He was a patient there, so they allowed me to come. 
because it was too difficult for me to go to other hospitals. They're a little bit more lenient now. They allow veterans to go to, say, Leahy Clinic and, and the VA because they're close and they, they help each other out. But um, no, nurses were not. How important do you feel serving in the military was and how did it affect your life? moving forward? Oh, first of all, I think that um, I gained a great deal of self-confidence. I gained a lot of respect from the people I worked with. And I, I had a husband who was in the American Division from Massachusetts here, even though he lived in Brooklyn. He was assigned to the Brooklyn, the Massachusetts unit. And he, <laughs> he was funny. He was a, uh, had all kinds of medals and so forth because he did all kinds of heroic history. But he was a little jealous of the attention that I got, which made it difficult to join veterans' organizations because he didn't even want the fellas to come up and talk to me. Sometimes he would show his jealousy. It took me a long time to tell him that I wasn't going to, <laughs> you know. I wasn't being personal, we were just being ex-soldiers together. Sure. But it was such a unique situation oh, for you at that time, wasn't it? I had it? friends in New York. I belonged to a couples club at my church. And uh, one time, I don't know, the fellas were in the group talking and uh, uh, my husband turned to them and he said, you know, he said, my wife was sitting and everybody's face went, because you just didn't. Meaning you were in the Battle of the Bulge or you were in the service or you I saw. I think I had a very exciting military career. I would say you do. Is there anything else you would like to add or any comment you would like to leave or to make? to your family or to those who are going to be seeing this tape. Again, he, uh, Is there one other comment that you would like to make as we finish up this interview that you'd like to say to those who will be watching this tape, your family and, and others who will be watching it? No. Um, I do know that my husband did become proud of it once I you know, kind of got him over. He was a, sort of a very jealous fellow. And, he, and um, my daughters think I'm something very special. They brag about their mother being in the military. And so I, and I go to now, I go to the Battle of the Bulge thing and when I do, they look for me and are extremely friendly. And it's just a great joy to have people feel that way about you. Well, not only do your family and your daughters think you're a very special person, but Rose Doing Young, we all do. Thank you very, <laughs> Thank much. You very much. Oh, it was great. Thank you.